Thank you very much. It's been an amazing three days, so we'd like to close a little bit with uh, something different. We spent a tremendous amount of time talking about how technology and policy are influencing the cyber conflict landscape. So in this last discussion, we'd like to look a little bit farther forward, discuss some emerging trends in technology that are going to influence that landscape in the years to come. To do that, we have two excellent speakers. Uh, the first I'd like to welcome up is Dr. Kevin Jones, Head of Cybersecurity Architectures, Innovation and Scouting at Airbus. Dr. Jones leads a global team in covering research innovation, state-of-the-art solutions development, and technology scouting for cybersecurity. He's active in the cyber research community, having published and many times and holds multiple patents. He received his PhD in 2010 for his work on a trust-based approach to mobile agent systems and is a frequent speaker. He works closely with government, including his participation in the European Control System Security and Incident Analysis Network. Welcome Dr. Jones to the stage. In addition, we're going to have Dr. Brian Pierce, the Director of the Information Innovation Office at the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Dr. Pierce joined DARPA in 2014 and holds more than 30 years' experience in the defense and aerospace industry. He previously served as Technical Director for Space and Airborne Systems at Raytheon, the Deputy Office Director in the Strategic Technology Office at DARPA, and the Executive Director of the Electronics Division at Rockwell Scientific, having previously worked with both Hughes Air Corps Company and Raytheon. He holds his PhD in chemistry from UC Riverside and holds over 20 U.S. patents. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Pierce for our first presentation? Let's go right ahead. Great. So DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in Washington, D.C. And I think for those of you familiar with DARPA, you know that we like to tackle difficult problems. So what I'm going to do today is share with you uh, some of the technologies that we're developing to empower cyber deterrence. So the world would really be quite different today if DARPA in the late 1960s had not invested in making computers talk to each other as a network, the ARPANET. This network grew very slowly at the beginning, and what you see here are the first four nodes, three in California and one in Utah. In 1970, it reached the East Coast of the United States, and in 1981, there were about 200 host computers with a new host connecting roughly every 20 days. Well, of course, the rest is history, with uh, today over 40% of the world's population, or more than 3 billion people possessing an internet connection. The exponential expansion of the internet has certainly boosted our productivity to incredible heights. But of course, it also has open avenues for bad behavior by a spectrum of threats ranging from individuals to nation states. And at DARPA, we're really looking how we can deter these threats. Um, there are often raised three concerns about cyber deterrence. The first concern relates to the proverb, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. In other words, the dependence or our dependence on a vulnerable cyber infrastructure could constrain our cyber deterrence actions. A second concern is that cyber attackers have so far been able to maintain a high degree of anonymity, which makes it difficult to identify and deter them. And the third concern is that if we decide to mount a credible, in-kind response to a cyber attack, we would like our response to be accurate and calibrated. So to address these concerns, we organize our cyber deterrence technologies into three areas with objectives to one, strengthen the cyber resilience of our networks and systems, which include cyber physical ones such as the electric power grid. And in fact, in reference to an earlier uh, discussion, we have a program ongoing to really try to improve or increase the speed of a black start recovery of a power grid following a cyber attack. Two, we'd like to achieve broad cyber situational awareness, which includes attribution of attackers. And three, we want to create accurate and calibrated cyber response capabilities. We'd like to put that on the table, recognizing that policy may not quite be there ready to take advantage of these technologies. So I will use now a program selected from our cyber portfolio, which actually contains over 20 programs, but take these few and just use them to illustrate each of these three areas, starting with strengthening cyber resilience. So we have built for ourselves 
metaphorically, a cyber glass house at which adversaries can freely cast stones. Now, we would like our house to be certainly resilient against these attacks. And construction does play a very big role in resilience. I really want to construct things correctly from the beginning, rather than fix them over a, a rather extended period of trial and error. So consider the purchase of a hardened glass door for my house. I go to a store, I look at several doors. I like the one with stainless steel hinges, but I notice there's a small crack in the glass near the lower hinge. Now, I ask for another door because I don't want a weakened one, and one door without defects is brought to me. Now, what if I've been told that all doors made by that manufacturer come with a crack near one of the hinges? But they'll send me a patch in a week to fix it. And furthermore, additional cracks will appear in the future for which will require new patches. Now, I think most of you would find this answer unacceptable, and you'd look at doors made from other manufacturers. Now, unfortunately, all software we buy today, and I emphasize all, comes with defects and vulnerabilities. And we accept a continual cycle of patching. We really want to change that paradigm, and toward that end, we have programs using formal methods to ensure that software is built as specified, that it is correct by construction. Software that does what it's specified to do and nothing else helps tremendously in hardening it against cyber attack. We are developing tools and technologies for code construction using formal methods for embedded systems, such as in the mission computer for a helicopter. In this particular case, we hardened the operating system in two control modules. We left unprotected the code for the camera module and gave that code, we gave complete access to that code to a red team, challenging them to break out of it into the rest of the system. Now, we had formally proven that an attacker could not break out of this camera software. And indeed, they couldn't do so, thereby really upholding the power of mathematics. So, of course, there's challenges here in how you scale this particular approach, but at least that's a start. Now, of course, despite our best efforts to repel cyber attackers by hardening software, they do get in, and we use automation to engage them in machine time rather than human time. And one DARPA program that epitomizes this approach is the Cyber Grand Challenge. With the objective of automating what human hacker teams do in DEF CON's Capture the Flag competition. The automation developed under the challenge includes the discovery and patching of software vulnerabilities. Each of the seven teams that were finalists in the final event developed software-based cyber reasoning systems that went head-to-head -head in the world's first machine versus machine cyber competition held at the beginning of DEF CON in 2016 in Las Vegas. It was a great success. The first prize of $2 million was won by a startup from Carnegie Mellon University. The second prize of $1 million went to a team composed of the company Gramatech and a group from the University of Virginia. And the third prize of $750,000 was won by a team from University of California at Santa Barbara, actually at Shellfish, who also competed in Capture the Flag. Now, a major highlight of the event was that software flaws can last minutes instead of as long as years. For example, one of the cyber reasoning systems discovered a software vulnerability actually unknown to humans in one of the rounds of the competition, and there were 96 rounds. And then three rounds later, a second cyber reasoning system uploaded a patch to this vulnerability in a lapsed time of only 15 minutes. I really can't emphasize enough how much this type of automation is really a game changer in how we go about strengthening cyber resilience. So that's two programs pertaining to cyber resilience. It's not all of them in our portfolio. But building on this foundation of cyber resilience, I'd like to now turn to situational awareness in support of cyber deterrence. So here's our friend. He's uh, trying to find out who's been throwing those stones against his glass house. Of course, really trying to get deeper insight into and situational awareness of adversarial activity. We've started a program called Enhanced Attribution that addresses the cyber deterrence concern of anonymity. The program aims to make transparent malicious cyber actions 
and individual cyber operator attribution through high fidelity visibility into many aspects of an attacker's activities. Our approach involves the correlation and fusion of data from a variety of sources, including commercial threat feeds, network IDS data, as well as NetFlow, to detect and characterize the data tracks between an attacker and its target. This information can then be used to provide a convincing public attribution of a cyber attack. Now, there are additional programs that are working on developing technologies for cyber situational awareness. But what I'd like to do is turn to a couple of programs that are working to create accurate and calibrated cyber response capabilities. Now, so really now that I've been able to find out who has been throwing the stones, I would like to provide multiple options in terms of the possibility of an accurate calibrated response. So here's our friend here doing actually quite a great job at, uh, in his response to those attacks. We have a program called Plan X that has developed a mission command platform for cyber operational planning and execution. In addition to providing a common operating picture of cyberspace that extends from network topologies down to individual programs running on a given computer, Plan X has developed a suite of automated tools for cyber operators who cannot be assumed to have degrees in computer science, electrical engineering, or related fields. These tools include the automated analysis of cyber courses of action. Third-party applications that provide a range of capabilities can be accommodated through a Plan X app store. <coughs> and other notable features include laptop deployability, as well as the ability to train while conducting operations. So now let me shift to really my last program that I'll highlight. It's called Harnessing Autonomy for Countering Cyber Adversary Systems, HACCS or HACS, which really is trying to address the threat of, of botnets. I think we all know that malicious actors are certainly today very capable of compromising and using with impunity large numbers of third-party computers and other devices. Such collections of conscripted devices also known as botnets, are used for criminal, espionage, computer network attack purposes, often a combination of all three. Recent examples of botnets and similar malicious code, of course, include Mirai and WannaCry. The potential scale of the effects of botnets make them a, secu a national security threat. And really, just improving the security posture of blue networks is not sufficient to counter these threats as the majority of their nodes reside in neutral networks or so-called gray space. And of course, we are very limited in terms currently of what we can do against these nodes in gray space. So we really need the ability to identify and neutralize botnets and other really large-scale malware and conscripted devices and systems in a manner that is scalable, timely, safe, and reliable, and in accordance with privacy and legal guidelines. And we just started the HACS program to meet this need. So in cyberspace, computers operate on nanosecond timelines with billions and even trillions of operations per second. In order to prevail in this space, we really cannot have humans in or on the loop given those very rapid timelines. And so the human must now delegate to a machine that executes the, lap, the, the loop under their supervision. Now this partnership or symbiosis is fundamental to the technologies that we're developing to help empower cyber deterrence, of course, by one, looking to strengthen the cyber resilience of our networks and systems, which do include cyber physical ones, such as the grid. Two, really achieving broad cyber situational awareness, which includes attribution of, ta of attackers. And three, creating accurate and calibrated cyber response capabilities. Now, in parallel with these advances, we also are working to develop technologies that ensure the trust of the human in the machine, which includes trust in the integrity of data, that's through a program called Media Forensics, and trust in machine learning AI through a program called Explainable AI. So really, that completes my presentation. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, so thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I should immediately open with a little confession. Uh, I am a recovering techie. 
So my background is in security architectures, developing uh, secure systems, and also from the perspective of having previously done pen testing, red teaming, offensive cyber, whichever buzzword we're using for that these days. However, more recently, it's become my genuine privilege to lead the team of security experts uh, at Airbus that spend their life researching the latest technologies, the latest trends, developing our own capabilities in-house that protect a global enterprise. So I'm going to go through a few of those today. Um, and this is my favorite type of talk to give. Uh, the only challenge I see with this type of talk when I'm trying to predict the future is that it's a little bit like being a fortune teller at a funeral. There is only two ways this can go. I told you so, or I didn't see that coming. So bear with me while I go through these. I'm going to come from both the defensive and the offensive side and try and touch on a little bit of what we're seeing as the state of the art today. So at least you know what I'm talking about in my later slides are somewhat grounded in, in some version of truth. On the cyber defense side, what we're seeing uh, really are the challenges and the emergence of new technologies that are coming into large enterprises. And to a certain extent, we're seeing the same technologies coming into military environments as well. Uh, firstly, we're seeing an unparalleled evolution in data, the amount of data that's being created, the amount of data that's being processed, um, and how, how we're having to transfer that across an infrastructure. We're also seeing more interconnectivity than ever before. Just in case there was ever any doubt, our perimeter has gone. No longer can we defend at the perimeter or edges of our infrastructure. There is too many interconnectivities, too many things that we cannot manage even today. And it is only going to get worse into the future as we introduce even more things into our infrastructures. But that then provides also some challenges. Um, if we don't have control of our perimeter, that makes things like patching very difficult. It makes things like maintenance and configurations very difficult. And the technologies that we need to be developing now are to help us make sure we can do those configurations, make sure we can control those extended enterprises that we're going to be offering. Cloud technology is coming in in a very large way. I mean, we can now have software as a service. We can have platforms as a service. Uh, we're reliant on contracts and legal requirements, as well as the technical solutions like crowd, cloud brokers that can help us to protect those infrastructures. We're also seeing an emergence of uh, mobile devices coming in, uh, not only looking at mobile devices that we manage, but mobile devices that uh, are being used by our employees. A uh, concrete example I use from the world of critical national infrastructures, the one thing you can never account for is somebody charging their mobile phone in a safety critical system, such as, I don't know, a transport control infrastructure. By definition of the fact it's mobile, that means it's been outside of my control, outside of my infrastructure. So that was always one of the types of techniques we were looking at in a previous life to try and uh, be a weakness or a chink in the armor of the defenders. Can I use a device that I know is going to be in and around that infrastructure? We're also seeing the emergence of IoT. You've all heard and, and various things about IoT this week, uh, by which, of course, I mean the Internet of Trouble. Wearable technologies, smart technologies, they're already here today. The idea behind them is they are sensor-based. They are um, very cheap to deploy. Um, We've seen only earlier this year uh, that, for example, wearable technologies for Fitbits and smarts, um, fitness tracking tools can, when they're used with things like Strava, give away the location of military bases because nobody puts their privacy settings. Um, by the way, even if you do put privacy settings and someone hacks your account, I still know where you've been. But that's the type of information leakage that we have to deal with. We're also seeing, though, on a more security-based side, a re-emergence of what we call DevOps or SecOps. So really going back to some of the basics and high fidelity security in the areas where we do still have control. But that makes it very difficult uh, for us to do that on a global scale. It's well worth looking at our adversaries. We don't often talk enough on the defender side around what our adversaries are doing and how they're targeting us. But until we can understand that, we genuinely cannot defend ourselves and our infrastructures and our data particularly well. There's different types of adversaries that we're facing, and some for cybercrime, for example, to your average hackivists, right up to nation state actors that are advanced persistent threats. I should stress in the moment the lines between them 
uh, is somewhat blurry. You know, we can no longer be certain who is doing what, where, and when. It's no longer the, the kiddie, the script kiddie with a hoodie in his bedroom. But what we are seeing is the prevalence of new tools in the hacker's armory. We're seeing a lot more automation in what they can do. And that can be as simple as things like automated tools that do multiple steps of an attack process as they move through from intelligence to the later stages of the kill chain. We're seeing the prevalence of automatic code generation or polymorphic malware that changes its behavior and changes its code base after it's been deployed to evade detection. We're seeing a big difference between the actors that are what we call scattergun actors that are sending things out and can do mass damage, uh, intentional or unintentional, versus those that are much more targeted. There's a lot more effort and energy that's gone into a very specific targeted attack against an actor or, or a system. More worryingly, perhaps, is these services are available to buy. You can go on the deep web and the dark web and you can buy hackers for sale. You can buy technologies and tools and data that you need to perform your attacks for sale. So, there is now a service model in the attacker community. And that's one area I certainly think that we need to do better on the defender side to disrupt and to understand. We don't have enough research in that area at the moment. We're also seeing um, the prevalence of new APTs that are coming through. So technologies that have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, are very targeted and have modular plugins for different types of systems. And I'll touch on some of those that have targeted nation states later on in the slide deck. The issue we have on the attacker's side when we look at this, though, is they very quickly become the tools of your average adversary. No longer can we say that you know, the Eternal Blue or the Eternal Star technologies that were there uh, were, were very quickly in the hands of cyber criminals. And that's why I say the lines are blurring a little bit. So there really are trends that are coming after everything, anything, right down to things that are very specific. So what technologies are emerging? What do we have today, what are we on the cusp of that really helps us defend these systems? So we've heard a lot over the last few days around automation, machine learning, and AI. Especially for vendors and when you're talking to them, I cannot stress this enough. Automation is not artificial intelligence. And I really genuinely mean that. What we have to consider, though, is that both are very, very important to what we do. Automation should not be forgotten in the world of artificial intelligence and where we're going. We can still have systems that respond in the right way and in the relevant way. We've seen that with the emergence of things like moving target defense, where data moves around the infrastructure. Data is generated on the fly to confuse an adversary when they're inside your infrastructure. We can see systems that reconfigure IPs or firewall rules. That's still deterministic. That's automation. But in a world where the attackers have automation, have code that changes, we need that on the defender's side as well. We're seeing machine learning, um, whether that's things like uh, deep learning neural networks, that are starting to analyze data. The problem and the challenges with machine learning are, quite frankly, we have to have good data sets. Not only good data sets, we have to have good representations of the environments we're going to be deploying them in. So actually, the effectiveness of machine learning techniques for attack detection, either you have supervised learning where you need a very good model, or you have unsupervised learning, which takes a very long time to train. I'm not saying that we're not going to get there. I'm saying that that is the current state of the art, and we need to make sure we're still pushing in those direct directions with the research. Then we have this futuristic view of AI, machines versus machines. We are a long, long way from having that in the cyberspace today. Um, it's not impossible, and I know there is research going on in very large-scale programs to do that. But actually, we need to achieve the automation and the machine learning first. Other techniques we're seeing, endpoint protections coming through, that type of activity is very much there so we can protect our infrastructures. Uh, ASLR or micro-virtualization, segmenting applications from other parts of the operating systems. That gives us a very good defense once people are in. Um, but again, that doesn't help us when, for example, you have IoT devices connected into your infrastructure. I can tell you for certain that in our research labs the other day, just for fun, we hacked an automated coffee pot, uh, uh, IoT coffee pot. You cannot account for somebody having that type of device on your infrastructure and somebody pivoting through. So you have to still have segmentation. Uh, cloud security, 
there are techniques already out there that manage the data, manage the infrastructure. Um, you have different third-party agencies that can manage the cryptography that goes there. Blockchain is very good in areas such as supply chain management. Um, we seem to be in a world where blockchain is the answer to everything. Uh, but in fact, there are certain use cases where it is a very good solution, others where it is not. And we need to be very careful with that technology. Um, but for supply chain management, managing those parts and components and making sure that they are authentic is a really good option for blockchain. And on the, uh, looking from an enterprise perspective, we still have to then say we have residual risks. So how do we manage those residual risks? Things like cyber insurance. I finally want to touch on nation states and critical national infrastructure and the trends that we're starting to see there. CNI is a very interesting space, and we've spent a lot of time making sure, uh, specialist areas of industrial control systems, um, we know the types of threats and risks that are coming at industrial control. We're a manufacturing company. But that also means we're very good at understanding the threats and risks that come at other types of industrial control systems, critical national infrastructures, water, power, electricity, gas, etc. And there's two uh, pieces of malware we saw last year that was targeting those. Crash override or in destroyer is uh, a modular piece of malware designed specifically for targeting power distribution networks. It has modules and plugins that mean I can control a power distribution network. Um, actually, it's a remote access Trojan, so it means I can do intelligence gathering about the grid. Uh, we saw the same type of behavior a number of years ago with Havex with a piece of malware. So if any of you are uh, malware analysts in the room, there's a lesson to be learned there. You have to give your malware a cool name like Indestroyer if anyone actually is going to hear about it. We've then seen more, uh, more recently last year a piece of malware called Triton that targeted a Tritonics safety system. So now we've got targeted attacks against the SCADA, the supervisory control systems, uh, at the IT level, and we've got attacks against the safety or the secondary backup systems. That means I can start to have a, an effect on industrial controls. However, and I do make a big statement here, however, having a guaranteed large-scale and kinetic effect against an infrastructure is very difficult. All too often we hear people saying, uh, we can just take down a power grid. I'm not doubting you can, but you have to be inside an infrastructure like that for months or years to do the intelligence gathering you need to be able to design and craft a relevant attack method, a relevant piece of malware that has that effect. Can you guarantee then that the safety systems don't kick in, or can you guarantee that there isn't a resilience and backup systems? And that is the type of challenge we face on the technical level, and it is going to be even more of a challenge on the legal and ethical and compliance levels that a lot of this audience are going to be very interested in. I cannot just launch and press a button and something happens until we get to AI. At the current parent stage, these processes take a very long time. I have to craft something very specific. On the counter to that, the systems I'm targeting could also potentially change. It only takes a momentary patch, and that particular uh, piece of malware or that particular vulnerability no longer exists. I spoke about Eternal Blue and those type of methods earlier, which was under underpinning the WannaCry. The problem was it was patched three months earlier. So actually, that's bad cyber hygiene on the defender's part, not an advanced threat. So we do have to be very careful when we're in this space. Um, also, we should consider very carefully, uh, specifically for this audience, where we're going with terms like cyber warfare. And uh, I was very pleased that uh, we funded some research and undertook some research with one of my colleagues, Dr. Michael Robinson, who actually published a paper in 2015 looking at some of the definitions and some of the challenges with really defining and integrating cyber warfare. However, if we now take a step into the future and say, OK, let's take an assumption that cyber warfare and cyber warfare-like activities exist, what does that actually mean after the event. So if you do have, in this context, a cyber weapon of some kind that's launched against an infrastructure, there has to be a phase of disarmament afterwards. And that then puts us in the realm of cyber peacekeeping. And Michael uh, has also written a paper last year, really as a thought leadership piece, looking at what it means to do disarmament, to do um, backtracking from a state of war with you, the use of cyber weapons. How does it mean to do buffer zones, for example, in cyberspace? Do these things actually apply? So this is all the type of narrative that we need to be start thinking around in the CNI space. 
So I've taken a peer into the, uh, into the future, and I think that probably teases up nicely for some of your questions. So thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you both. It's, it's fascinating to hear the variety of perspectives on what's coming for offense, what's coming for defense. I want to dig a little bit into both your presentations and then we'll start a more general discussion. Um, Brian, looking specifically at you, we've had this discussion about software assurance going on 30 years now. Um, and this idea of formally verified systems have been around for a little bit. What makes you optimistic at this moment? Um, could you give us a sense of some of the challenges that have been present in the past in deploying these systems and why now might be a more mature moment? Well, what we've done under the program, the particular program I highlighted was called High Assurance Cyber Military Systems, or HACMS. Uh, it was focused on embedded systems, uh, automobiles, those kinds of vehicles, uh, aircraft, helicopters. So these are modestly sized uh, codes, you know, you're talking 100,000 lines max. So we have been able to push it to that point. Um, that has been a, a major issue, also the availability of tools that make this more accessible. You don't need to rely on expensive uh, specialists who develop this code. So that was one of the aspects of the program, was to be able to make this more available. And uh, we've done that in open source, so there's an open catalog that can address that. Uh, however, it's still far short of some of these enormous uh, <laughs> code uh, sizes that we're dealing with. Uh, we have embarked on a new program called uh, Cyber Assured Systems Engineering with really the objective to either eliminate or minimize penetration testing at the end of uh, a system development process. Because right now, uh, cyber resiliency is not a primary requirement because it's the challenge is how do you test for that? So how can we incorporate elements of formal methods modeling and simulation approaches that could give us that kind of confidence where we can avoid that, that cycle of uh, design, build, and then you f at the end do penetration testing, feed that back into the process. So one of the elements that we're looking at is can we look at uh, the composability of much larger uh, software systems in the context of formally verified modules? And there's maybe some hope there, but I know I totally uh, am aware of the challenges we've faced. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting set of problems, without doubt. Uh, Kevin, turning to you for a moment, we hear a lot about IoT as this massive new attack surface. There's yep. a lot of discussion about Mirai and the threats it poses to the internet ecosystem. I'm curious, could you break out for us, what does IoT look like in terms of how it's impacting the attack surface for owners and operators versus all other users in the internet? Okay. So I think that there's a couple of ways we can answer this. The first one is looking at IoT devices that are used and embedded within the environment that you're operating and defending. Um, these devices are, by definition, uh, fairly cheap to deploy. They're highly sensors. They, they are deployed on mass scale. And we're going to see that more and more. So actually, that really makes your defensive surface much more complex. Um, and they're usually using proprietary OSs and, and not your standard AV, so it doesn't fit into your patch management cycles. So actually having them in your enterprise and in your infrastructure is, is a challenge. And we've seen a number of attacks. Target was used as example earlier this week that came in through heating and ventilation and those type of uh, IoT devices. Um, I think perhaps on a, on a larger scale, though, some of the biggest risks are, as you said, the Mari and how IoT is used to generate mass data and mass services that can be distributed denial of service attacks on a scale that is unprecedented and we haven't really seen before. And I think that's going to put huge challenges on the infrastructure that we currently operate and rely on uh, for everyday activities. Do you see the response to that as being enhancing existing processes or having to come up with new security measures, new security processes? So I think there's, there's a debate on should IoT be um, uh, checked and, and validated? Should there be some form of certification for IoT devices? Um, and I think there's good arguments on both sides. I don't personally think you'll see that. I think the, it's, the, the horse is already gone and the doors are already open. Um, so I think you, the only answer that we currently still have is to put new processes in place on, on our defensive side, um, whether that's completely segregating the IoT, whether that's putting them outside of the organization and allowing people to dial in via the internet and other methods. Um, but at the moment, we don't have a good enough uh, understanding of where these assets are being deployed uh, in infrastructures, what they're running, what are the vulnerabilities in them, um, and how quickly we can respond. There is a fairly uh, good understanding of things like patch management for your standard IT infrastructure. We haven't got that yet in the IoT world, and I think we are going to need it. Interesting. Okay. You both spoke about automation. I think this is something that's come up a couple of times in the past few days. I wonder, 
going to you, Brian, first, if you could talk a little bit about within the grand challenge, how did automation end up favoring the offense versus the defense? What was the balance of, of benefit between those two sides? It's, um, I'd like to talk about that, but there's, actually, I just can't resist on the IoT. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's just worth mentioning, there's a, uh, we have an effort, uh, and why I mention it, because it's, it's an interesting approach where IoT devices being low resource devices, it's, there's challenges what you can do to secure them. So the approach being pursued is looking at the physical or analog signals that are emanated while software is running on a, you know, a physical device, a hardware, there's electromagnetic emissions, acoustic, et cetera. Can you use those to characterize normal operating states for the software on the IoT device? And then when you start to see deviations in that collection of signals, that could be an indicator, at least you want you know, a, a high confidence, that there's something amiss in terms of the software. And there's been evidence of this. And how can you actually use that from a defense? Of course, it takes you into side channels, has other, <laughs> but how can you sort of flip that and put it on a defensive side? So anyway, it's an interesting problem uh, that uh, it merits. But to your question on, on automation, um, so in the Cyber Grand Challenge, it used what, uh, what we call the first wave of AI. Uh, we can't forget expert systems, rule-based systems. That's a legitimate AI. It's one that sort of gets forgotten here a bit with all the rage of machine learning. But it was using certain uh, expert uh, insight that was helping the, uh, these systems to perform their goal of finding vulnerabilities and, and patching them. Um, it's worth noting that machine learning is quite a challenge when you look at zero days, because a zero day, by its definition, it's not in the training set. So you're going to be very much challenged by looking at machine learning from that perspective. Not to say that it might have its place. So uh, that was the level of automation in Cyber Grand Challenge. I think what we also found there are limits to what can be done by machine. Machines are quite good at finding syntactic type of uh, vulnerabilities where you might have memory uh, type of uh, problems, et cetera, very, very important problems, but not the whole range of vulnerabilities. And so what we are looking at now is how do you really bring the human expert and the machine together to be more efficient and how you can look at the full span of vulnerabilities in regard to, for example, more logical type of vulnerabilities, semantic, where the human is quite good to be able to pick that out. How can you have the machine and the human work together to get that whole spectrum? And of course, from one, really, vulnerabilities um, serve the offense as well as the, uh, the defense. I'd say one clarification on Cyber Grand Challenge, there really wasn't an offensive, it, it, it did deviate from capture the flag from that perspective. And we had to work to control the teams from <laughs> <laughs> uh, doing what is normally done under capture the flag uh, well, openness. So we wanted them to really focus on the question of discovery of vulnerabilities and patching. You could argue a patch might be construed as some way to take advantage of it, but we didn't go down that path. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Kevin, you talked a little bit about automated code generation and polymorphic malware. Um, in your mind, or at least in what you're seeing, what are the big trends here? How is this use of automation in the offense, particularly from malware generation, evolved in the last couple of years? So I think on, on the offensive side, um, as you said, polymorphic malware, so malware that can change its code base on the fly but retain its, its original areas. Uh, also malware that can understand the type of environment that it's operating in and execute differently, depending on if it's in a VM or if it's in a, an infrastructure. We've seen uh, ransomware type malware that will only execute at a specific time, i.e. Uh, it will learn the point at which you run backups and it will learn your infrastructure before it executes. Um, so that type of automation is already being used by the adversaries. Um, I think we're still on the cusp of automation on the defender side, and that's perhaps uh, even more interesting. One of the areas that um, the, the kind of tit for tat, if you like, is, is helping there is as more malware is being generated by seeded approaches, it's generating a huge amount of data for the defenders uh, in the security operation centers, uh, in the malware analysis and how we can automate those processes because ultimately a level one or a level two SOC analyst um, or a malware analyst still only has a limited amount of time. We only have a limited amount of budgets for those type of people. So we, we're starting to see automation on the defender side being used very much to sift through mm. what is in those data sets. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other side on the defense, I touched on it earlier, we, we need to look more at how the systems themselves have resilience by responding to the different types of attack they can see. Um, and we've, 
uh, we've got some research in-house, I was, I was talking yesterday about, um, where we're trying to predict using machine learning uh, whether something is more or less likely to be a malicious piece of software. And the recent publication we've put out uh, suggests that for specific types of malware, things like ransomware, um, we can have 94% accuracy that it's going to be ransomware within four, four seconds of execution. So that means that the system, if it already knows that, can have a set of rules by which it can then change the system or stop the execution. And that type of automation, I think, is we're on the cusp of it, and we can definitely take that into new areas to help defend ourselves. So looking over all of these issues, all these trends that you guys have identified, where would you pick out and say, this is this piece of technology or this general trend in the community is the most likely to provide benefit to the defender, allowing them to react more rapidly, to change its scale. What would you pick out as the one thing? Start with Brian. Well, uh, certainly the uh, automation uh, on the defensive side, and as uh, Kevin was describing, this ability to pick out patterns. In that respect, machine learning is very effective. And of course, you want to get away from signature-based approaches. Of course, then, even with machine learning systems, we have to be aware that they can be spoofed as well. Yeah. And that's in a whole interesting area in its own right. However, it is to your advantage. Now, in terms of code generation, there's a whole field now developing that's called big code, sort of a play on big data where you're looking at sort of similar to data analytic techniques to be able to construct code towards the lines of building a corpora, and then you can have a search engine that builds with it if you wanted, for example, um, sort of an autocomplete for software using that. So that is emerging. But I would say the other area that is also valid is that how do we protect the, uh, the human uh, user from uh, social engineering and the like? And, it's an interesting area that we're starting to explore in terms of how might one have as a representative, as you engage in your various communication channels, I could think of a, of a chatbot or equivalent to serve as my intermediary with an attacker. Because that, as we start to close up these uh, vulnerabilities, we still have to deal with the human uh, user in that respect. So that's, a, that's an important area as well. So for me, I think I'd echo exactly what's just been said in terms of uh, automation. I think the, the third area I would add to that is probably around, uh, on the defender side, doing much more around information sharing and making uh, intelligence vulnerability mm. disclosures much more actionable and usable. Um, we have to reduce that time. And th there must be a reason why the likes of WannaCry was so successful when the patch was released months earlier. And the, there must be a reason why people aren't patching those systems. Um, or aren't getting the level of intelligence they need to be able to defend themselves properly. And we've, we're starting to see the emergence of uh, information sharing or intelligence sharing uh, for vulnerabilities, using things like sticks and taxi, and how I make that actionable, rather than just, I'm sending you a list of the top 100 vulnerabilities. Um, so I think that would be the third area that I would really add to that, and, and we need to look at. So one of the uh, keynotes yesterday highlighted the degree of trust that we have in these systems at a fairly low level and moving up the stack. I wonder for both of you, What's the trend that you see in terms of the, our ability to trust? Brian, you mentioned this, uh, this profiling of behavior on IoT systems to authenticate good from bad. What's the trend that you see in terms of our ability to trust these systems at a low level to implement those sorts of behavioral profiles, the sort of automated defenses, Kevin, that you've talked about? So I don't think it's just at a, a low level, per se. I think we have to trust systems at all levels. Um, and I used cloud as the example earlier. Uh, a lot of enterprises and a lot of technologies are moving out to cloud services, and there is a whole bunch of things you have to trust in the middle. Um, and we talk a lot around defense in depth, and I'm surprised it hasn't been mentioned quite, quite as often the last couple of days as I would have expected. Um, so I think the answer is we need technologies throughout the chain uh, that can help us really truly provide defense at the different levels and defense in depth. Um, we also need to consider the humans and how we protect and advance the humans in terms of being much more security aware. And there's challenges there for us as well. Um, but I think we have to also accept that we operate in a completely untrusted environment, um, right down to supply chain coming through. Uh, so there are uh, things like uh, encrypted enclaves and those type of things that we can run in the OSs and, and on the chips. Uh, that can help us, and there's technologies emerging now that let us do, for example, fully homomorphic encryption is on the horizon, still a big challenge with subsets of polynomials, um, but that we, we are developing techniques that help us operate and execute in untrusted environments. Um, but they're still just tantalizingly over the horizon. Um, we haven't quite got them yet. 
that trust is a very important element to all of this, particularly as we delegate more responsibility to machines as they gain more autonomy, which is really critical in these very um, demanding environments in terms of the timelines you need to, well, detect uh, and respond. Uh, we have been looking at this question of machine learning AI. Uh, deep learning uh, sort of based systems are very good performing when they're trained with a lot of data. Uh, but they're opaque. It's this black box. And what we'd like to do is how do you make it possible for the human user to actually gain some understanding of what that black box is doing. So instead of just only providing uh, a number corresponding to the confidence in the pattern being detected and classified, can you also provide an explanation as to why it came to that conclusion? And this is guided by actually a parallel effort looking at the psychology of human explanation, which we feel is important of how are we now going to, as we see machines get more capable, they need to be able to communicate their results. So there's interesting challenges where you look at decision trees, which are very explainable. They're brittle, but they're very explainable. Can some look at a hybrid of a decision tree type of approach, maybe give up a little performance, but now you might be able to impose that along with uh, machine learning. So these are interesting uh, topics. The other one, of course, is trust in the data itself, um, looking at trust in, in data privacy, such as encryption, differential data privacy is, is an important one, secure multi-party computation, and then trust in uh, the data, uh, the integrity. What has been manipulated? So we are looking at efforts to break down integrity in terms of digital, physical, and semantic, where the digital is sort of the detection of inconsistencies in the pixels of, for example, an image uh, as an indicator. Of course, techniques now are quite sophisticated, and we saw that one example earlier this morning of people being able to superimpose particular facial expressions and audio. We are looking at how you can detect those types of manipulations, but it is definitely a, uh, uh, a spiral <laughs> of counter and counter counters type of operations. I'll just add to that on the machine learning side as well. I think. Yeah. The real challenge today in machine learning is not developing new machine learning algorithms. It, it's a challenge, but it's not the real challenge. They've been around and existed for a yeah. very long time. Yeah. Um, the challenge is really around uh, the training sets that we generate, but actually, more importantly, uh, the challenge is how do I master these technologies? How do I understand what they're doing? Um, can I introspect the way it makes decisions? And we've seen in previous experiments even things down to uh, the configuration of the GPUs can affect the results you get and how I take that out of the environment in which I learn and put it in a new environment. Is it still as effective? Can I trust that, that particular learnt model? And how do I update that model? Um, and again, I think those are mastering it is, or mastering machine learning well, is yeah, a far the, more difficult challenge. The, the practice has way outrun the science behind it. And we really do need to understand, I mean, at some point. But yeah, the, the algorithms we're using today are certainly been around. <laughs> that have been enabled by the uh, appearance or the development of GPUs, which, of course, is exciting, but it, we need to keep in mind that we want to understand the fundamentals here. So this is interesting. I, I, I want to dig into this a little more, but we have a couple of minutes left. So um, I'm going to ask one more question, after which we'll go to the audience uh, for your comments and thoughts. Given all that you guys have seen, given everything we've talked about today and it's been discussed over the last couple of days, what challenges would you give to the industry or to the community to improve the next couple of years to address the sort of trends you're highlighting? So I think for me, there's a few. Um, I think the first and biggest challenge we have is metrics, security metrics. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, as a community, we really suck at security metrics. Um, we still have things like time to patch or um, number of AV alerts or number of IDS signatures. Seriously, that doesn't really mean anything, especially when you escalate those to a decision level and a decision board. So from a security metrics perspective, um, we need to, to do a lot better. Um, we also see when it comes to the way that the media and, and we tell, tell the media to report on cyber breaches. Every year we see the biggest cyber breach ever. And actually what we mean is we've seen the most data breached ever or lost ever. If you leave your Amazon S3 web bucket completely open without an authentication, that's not a massive APT breach. That's bad configuration management. 
but because all of the data was lost. What, what that metric actually means is that businesses are storing more data than ever. So we need to be a lot better in the way that we actually say what is a breach, how we report metrics, how we report what we're doing. Um, and we can look at, for example, at uh, security metrics around how expensive it is for an adversary to perform a specific task or, or breach part of the system. And that's some of the types of research that we're looking at right now, is rather than saying this is what uh, we're implementing to do risk reduction, we're saying this, this risk reduction measure makes it percentage or cost more, more expensive for an adversary to have that effect. That also has the added bonus that we're not saying we're completely secure. Um, so how do we put the metrics in those, in those contexts? The second area, I think, for me, that we really need to, to challenge the security community on is human factors. And uh, we don't consider ourselves multidisciplinary enough as an industry. Um, we, we're all too often blaming the user. And we see these wonderful uh, memes that say, in this corner, we have all this technology. And in that corner, we have Fred, who clicked on a link. It's time we forget that. Um, it, let's not go back to the time. I mean, let, let's remember links are meant to be clicked. Uh, PDFs are meant to be opened. And we've got to the stage now where uh, phishing is always the example we use. And we say, user clicked on that link again. I'm sorry, but if that, that email looked genuine like it was from a service provider, let's call it Uber, for example, even if we train them to hover over that link, and it says uber.com, but actually, we haven't gone as far to tell them that that U has actually got an umlaut above it, which is a different character set, which takes you to a different site, and you still got owned by some APT. Let's get over that. Let's, let's, do, um, let's go back to the basics. And to be honest, we haven't got to seamless IT yet. The best platforms that we have that, that are operating are seamless to use. We are even further away from seamless security. And I think taking a user perspective is the first step along a long journey to get seamless security. And by the way, I also include in that um, making security systems simpler. If we have 30,000 firewall rules in a firewall, that is not manageable. Nobody has a clue what that does anymore. There's going to be vulnerabilities and holes there. So we need to really go back to the, the kind of human factors and human element. Um, and then my final, I think, area, with, without dragging on too much, will be, uh, again, on the multidisciplinary side, looking at legal, especially when it comes to critical national infrastructure. Um, at what point is the red line? At what point does commercial need support from governments and vice versa? Um, how do we do information sharing? And, and things like NIST and GDPR are certainly helping in that. Um, but we definitely need to look at what that actually means and how do you implement those. And there's a long step ahead in terms of um, really bringing that community together between business, legal, technical, human factors, and psychology. Um, and I think that would be the biggest challenge I would probably push out to the community. Or anything to add? I would just say uh, I certainly agree on metrics, because I think it's not just security, it's metrics for all these very important um, issues that we uh, are concerned about, but no metrics really exist, like data privacy, we need a metric, you know, we want to be able to assess that. Integrity, all these important questions along with security. And then along, you know, when you can start to do that, then you can perhaps establish uh, an approach that insurance companies can now have a way to gauge the degree of uh, security or the degree that privacy is at stake. So this kind of risk analysis, if one can technologically help support that and then see it taken forward by the industry in general, I think is very important. So I really echo that. Um, I do think that uh, this question of putting all the burden of security on the human user is the wrong direction. I mean, it's just going to end up where we don't want to use the systems anymore. But how can technology help to really alleviate that? And do that in a trusted manner is very important. The only two things I would add to what Kevin said is um, we are going to see much more uh, involvement of machines. I mean, we talk a lot about autonomous type of systems. In cyber, it, it's already there because of these kinds of short timelines. And we do need to look at how we delegate to machines. This gets you into the whole challenge of trust and assurance that it will do the right thing. And then finally, because technology can only go so far, I think technology is certainly moving ahead of policy and other considerations. And that really needs to start to look at what might be possible through technology and how that can really evolve the policy regarding cyber and all related activities. So, All right, yeah. challenge is set. Open up for a couple of questions from the audience before we have time to close. I think there are a couple of mics floating around. Why don't we go right up here first? Uh, thank you. I'm Lisa Pais from the Estonian Information System Authority. 
And my question is quite specific to where you ended with, which is the idea of information sharing and metrics. Yep. And when we look at the reality of how many cross-border dependencies we're having to deal with, so it's not just within one jurisdiction, it's not just within one network or one corporation, we also see that on the field, information sharing doesn't come naturally, and usually it happens either based on a threat or with a very strong incentive otherwise. So how would you go about incentivizing both corporations and governments who might have, let's say, bad hygiene of putting a stamp on it and hoping it goes away? Do you share more across borders? especially when it comes to these large cross-border dependencies of national infrastructure. And secondly, how would you go about creating a better set of shared metrics so that our indicators make sense to each other? So I'll answer that and say, I think between, certainly between the business sectors, there is a certain amount of sharing that already goes on, but it's usually ad hoc, and the challenge is how we bring that together more formally. Actually, um, the, the real challenge there, when you formalize how you share it and what you share it with, is, is twofold. It's trust and it's timeliness. Um, so I think if we look at return on, return on investment, return on why I would share something uh, from, a, from an enterprise perspective, I have to be able to get something back that I don't already know. And I have to be able to act in a timely way on that information to protect the business or protect the enterprise or protect the infrastructure. Um, and I'm not sure yet, uh, even within countries, but certainly cross-border, there is really a good system that enables us to do that. And I think looking at, I know the US is, is leading the way with the sticks and taxi, and actually ways that there is, um, is that, in, that sharing and very quickly disseminated. Um, the problem with that platform then becomes the trust in the intelligence. Because actually, I want something I can action on very quickly, and when you formalize it to an entity or a central position, and then it goes back out from there, it almost becomes the word of that entity or that central position or that central database. And if you action on it in the wrong way, the trust level in all of the intelligences in that database goes down. So I think one of the challenges that certainly the US has been looking at is can you tag, for example, vulnerability information or threat intelligence with a level of trust and say, here I have it right now, hot off the press, you can do what you like with it, but I haven't validated that vulnerability or that, that trust level yet. Um, and actually, I think once the systems move in those, that direction, it incentivizes people to use them, which also incentivizes people to share on them as an open platform and create a community. Um, so that's where I would go, and I think there, there is already signs it's going in that direction, but it needs to be stronger. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I look at it more from a, what technology can do to help facilitate that. Um, mentioned earlier was fully homomorphic encryption. You can relax that a bit. It may not need to be encrypted for all time. Maybe it's only uh, tens of years if you want to look. And that can sort of maybe lo lower the, uh, the load on the system. And these are techniques where I guess uh, two, two parties can keep encrypted they can collectively come together to do a calculation without revealing their data. And the, the result of the calculation is known to both. So that's very attractive in certain situations where there might be constraints of what can be shared from a classification point of view. Differential data privacy is another way that people are exploring as a way to share data. I don't need to know every detail. I may need just to know, let's say, your birth year. So that may, and then maybe fuzz it a bit so that I have certain uncertainty. There's techniques that are being explored. The challenge is scalability and the like, secure multi-party computation. I think all this is emerging to help maybe facilitate and take away at least the technical excuse that we can't uh, share without maintaining a certain level of privacy or, uh, let's say, proprietary. Another question right down here in the front. Well, I, you know, from and it's the same techniques, of course, to be able to do code generation. Uh, this is where 
Uh, as an example, I mentioned earlier, we have one program looking at uh, how one can tap into open source software. So yes, I mean, these are all possibilities looking at the future. Sure. Um, I would say really with regard to the, um, it's a program called Muse, Mining and Understanding Software Enclaves. And the idea is that I can tap this enormous resource of open source software as just an example, but techniques to be able to do this, certainly. Well, we've got a lot to chew on from the last couple of days, but I appreciate you all coming out to the last panel. I want you to join me in thanking our guests, Brian and Kevin. Thank you both very thank much. You.